Beautimus. Okay. So I am going to start sharing my screen and we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I will explain any of the pictures that are on um, on the slides, Jennifer. Most of them are just musical elements, but I'll explain what they are as they come up. So sharing my screen here. Let's go. Okay, so tonight review and expansion. So review of the stuff that we've already talked about and expanding upon those same things. So first of all, music is a collection of sounds and silences with a purpose. Although no one definition of it exists because of its different ways that it is integrated into different cultures. There are some cultures where music and dance and song are all part of the same word. And music can be different things to different people, including composers like avant-garde composers like John Cage, who has made himself a name for things like the prepared piano or four minutes and 33 seconds. So things like that. So music for us though, is either taught by ear or in written sheet music. We have notes on a staff of five lines and four spaces. And those notes tell us about two things pitch and duration. So we'll talk about that more in a moment. But first, the main things that we're talking about today um, are the three basic elements of music, the top three there. One, rhythm. Two, pitch. Three, intensity, meaning volume. And then there are two others, timbre and diction. We're not going to be able to touch on those this evening because there's just too many other things to go through. So first of all, we have to talk about what we're singing. So melody, which is the stuff that we sing, is the tune of the song, the main idea off of which typically the rest of the music is based. So it's composed of pitch and rhythm with a purpose. So those are the two defining qualities. Um, rhythm itself is the duration of numerous sounds and or rests together, often forming a pattern. So rhythm is the one that we're going to start uh, focusing on first. On this slide, Jennifer, there's just a couple of little stick figure notes and some rests. This next one is rhythm, common note symbol. So on here, there are five different images of different notes that have different durations. So the first one is that pair of eighth notes there with a beam on top. There's a quarter note, quarter rest, half note, and whole note. Those are like the most common notes that we see. There are some other variations though, but let's look at some common rhythm patterns. This first one here, we have a quarter note, quarter note, then two eighth notes, and a quarter note. And oftentimes when we're teaching that rhythm, we would say something like, long, long, short, short, long, or with other syllables like ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. The one to the right of it only has two notes. And this first one is one, two, three, four. Then the bottom one down here is another rhythm pattern. Ba, bum, bum, bum. So, What's up with the dot? We have a dot there on number two and a dot on number three. What do those things do? If you want something other than standard rhythms, you have to change the duration of one or more notes. This is how it makes it interesting. So there are two ways to do this. The first way is a tie. There's a picture of this up top with a half note first connected to another quarter note with a curved line in between them. This half note is two, this quarter note's one. So that whole thing right there equals three beats. And the other way to show a change in rhythm is this dot here, the half note with the dot right next to it, which also equals three beats. The dot itself is like shorthand. It's taking away 
this extra quarter note to save some space or to make it easier on the brain to see it, to group it. Um, and so here's a little example down here of how a tie and a dotted note might be seen. A tie oftentimes occurs <clears throat> when there's a longer held note across a bar line. And we'll talk more about bar lines in a moment. But if you look at this rhythm right here, I'll clap that out for you. It goes like this, clap, clap, clap. Then you hold, hold, T, T, ta, one, two, three. So the musical dot adds half of the value of the notes it's of the note it's attached to its partner note but the thing to remember is any rhythmic change will only impact the notes that come after it you can't change anything that comes before that note every alteration has to go after that so our brains really like to find patterns and group things together. And the same is true in music. We group music notes into measures or bars separated by that thing called a bar line. And here you'll see I have two blocks, one staff, which is separated by a bar line. So our five lines, four spaces, and a bar line there in between with that arrow pointing to where it goes. Um, the bar line, though, did not always exist. It seems to have originated in keyboard music between the 15th and 16th century. So up here at the top, I included a little example to show you how bar lines used to be used. This is a, a, a late 16th, early 17th century example of a sacred text, Dies Irae. And this one right here, shows that um, the bar lines were originally only used to separate notes to see them more easily based off of the phrases sometimes. Um, we'll talk more about this later, but this later evolved into denoting meter or time signature. But up here at the top, when it's first started to being used, you can see, first of all, there are no stems on these notes either. It's just the note heads on the lines, which also, if you look, there are only one, two, three, four of those. That's neither here nor there. The important thing is the bar line here. It's separating after one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight notes. But the idea is dies ire, dies ila, separation. Then solvet se clum in favila. So you have one other group and another group and then break testi david cum sibila and that is all one other measure so that's the old way that it used to be represented was just in groups like that to make it more easy to see the phrases and to end those phrases down here at the bottom though is our modern usage of a bar line a bar line for us is sort of like um musical math and they're based off of the rhythm so a bar line separates the um, the notes into chunks instead of into phrases necessarily so right here you can see four measures each of them are clearly marked off by this bar line so you have one two three bar line this note here one two three bar line, then three different notes again, one, two, three, bar line, and then two notes, one, two, three, bar line, which equates to one, two, three, four. Now in music, sometimes the bar lines or the, the bars rather are not always numbered each and every one of them. So one of the things that you might see is a number in the left hand corner that denotes where uh, the first measure is. And then on the very next line, there's another number in the far left corner, but now this number says five. Well, the other measures in between there, they don't not have numbers. They just don't number every single one of those so that it's less information um, to gather all at once. It's less cluttered and your brain doesn't have to try so hard to see the stuff that's on the page. So let's talk now about how the bar line evolved into becoming measures, which were based off of this little thing here, those two numbers on top of each other. 
the time signature. So time signature comes at the very beginning of music at the very beginning of a line next to the clef. So here we have a treble clef and next to it we have a four on top and a four on bottom. This top number indicates the number of beats per measure or per bar and the bottom number tells us which beat is quote getting the beat. It's the value of the beat. So there's those two important bits of information. Um, so there's also, oh shoot, I left mine out there in the living room. Carrie, if you're hearing me, can you bring those two um, handouts to me? They're on top of Eris's box. So this, um, there's a, a rhythm and uh, time signatures handout that has a couple of bits of information on it that'll be on this next slide for you as well. But I wanna show real quick this. Some time signature examples. Oh, you are the best. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's do some. Thank you. Okay, so I have my sheet here and I wanted to come back to you because Carrie brought it to me. So I had inside of the Google Drive folder two handouts that have some information on them. This one that I'm referring to right now is the rhythm and time signatures handout. On the front of it, the first part of it, it has all of these notes, the whole half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth, and even down to the 32nd note to show you what those look like, just the notes in general, and then also their rest counterparts because each note has its own respective rest of course because they all take up the same amount of time and down here at the bottom is this fun little music factor tree um just like in uh in high school i think it was what algebra or something like that that you do factor trees in same thing except for music notes where you start off with the whole note there at the top you have one whole note it lasts for four beats in common time. Um, and then it breaks down into our two half notes, four quarter notes, eight eighth notes, and 16 sixteenth notes. That's where they get their names from, is the division from the whole note. And how does that work though with the bottom number, right? So we know top number is how many beats? Bottom number is of what? How do those work into that? Well, if we're talking about common time, it's the most common time signature that we have, it's four beats, one, two, three, four, just like we walk. And so if we're talking about that, a whole note takes up four full beats, one, two, three, four. So we can only fit one of those per measure. If we are going to do a time signature that's based off of whole notes, we would do however many on top, over one on the bottom, because that bottom number represents the music symbol that we're using. Here's that example. So now I'll come back to my presentation and you'll see what I'm talking about there as well. Share, here we are. So our time signatures, <clears throat> the top one here, common time, four, four, we are four, beats of four quarter notes per measure. And then I put an example right there. Quarter note, quarter note, eighth, eighth, quarter note, eighth, 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 eighth half note. Now, I remind you that this is like music math because not all of these last for one beat. This one does, this one does, but this is a division. This grouping of two lasts for one beat all by itself but there are two of them, so they go faster. One beat, same thing here, subdivided one, subdivided one, and this one lasts for two beats. Underneath that, cut time. This is a symbol for cut time. It's the same as common time, but with the slash in the middle, showing you that it's most of the time twice as fast. So cut time is referenced as two half notes per measure. So that example right below that is half note, half note, 
quarter, quarter, half, note, like that. The waltz is probably the most um, recognizable way of calling out a three, four time signature. So you have three quarter notes per measure. So it's one, two, three, half note, bump, dun, 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 one, two, three, just like the dance, a waltz. And then this bottom one, there's an other section because there are these other um, time signatures that can go two different ways. Six, eight down here is six eighth notes per measure. And down here, I have an example showing you the two different ways that this can be represented. The first way is showing each of the eighth notes separated into groups of three, because we have one, two, three, four, five, six. But this dotted quarter note right over there is the same representation. It just takes up the same amount of time and is only one note. So clapping out that bottom rhythm sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now I say that this bottom time signature can be represented in two ways because there are two conducting ways as well that it can be represented. I'm gonna show you what I mean. So in a conducting experience like this, you could show six, eight time as a big two. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or you could show each individual note. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. It depends on your needs. And the same thing is true in how it's represented in the music. Sometimes the composer's needs are different. So they represent the notes or the time signature through the notes in a different way. It just matters what notes you're counting by so you can figure out what the division of it is supposed to be. So let's go back to our presentation now and talk about the other thing that meter does. So we know that it talks about how many beats and what kind of note gets the beat. But the other part that time signature is, is the meter part. And meter is also a general rhythmic feeling of the music and which beats are emphasized within the measure. So for example, in common time, 4-4, four, four, beats 1, and three are emphasized and felt more strongly, whereas beats two and four are weak. So for example, if we were to count something out, it would go like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And it's pretty evident through that vocalization where the strong beat is and where the weak beat is. And we can also see this right here modeled out where the melody is on a strong beat, it's very solid, there's nothing else that's going on there, it's moving pretty steadily, and we're used to that feeling. The other um, <clears throat> different way of feeling meter is in that waltz time, where there is one beat that is most strongly emphasized, whereas the other two beats are weak. And that is one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. So the emphasis is more on the downbeat of each of those measures rather than each and every note. So let's look over here now at this. So the feeling that meter gives a song is important when you consider these two elements here, rests and syncopation. Rests take up the same amount of time as their note counterparts and, as, and are just as important as the notes themselves. Because music is a combination of sounds and silences with an implied meaning most of the time. So those silences are often just as important and sometimes more important than when the music is being made. So we have here the representation, our whole rest looks like a hole in the ground, four beats, that whole thing there. Half rest sort of looks like a top hat. 
and that's two beats. Quarter rest is like that, um, like a Z on top of a C, but it's sort of just a squiggly line there. And then the eighth rest, the eighth rest looks different than the rest of them, but it looks most like its note counterpart, in my opinion, because of the way that um, it's shaped. And I can talk more about that in a little bit once we get to the actual like structure of a note and how to follow it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty neat. So let's talk about um, syncopation really fast. Syncopation occurs most in common time, at least in our experiences, and happens when a rhythm emphasizes an ordinarily weak beat. So here we have two examples, this top one that I've already sort of modeled, but I'll play it here for you on the piano so you can hear what it sounds like. We're in 4-4 time, it goes like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now what happens when we take it off of the strong beats and put it instead on the weak beats? It becomes syncopated. And that's what this sounds like. So we go like this, one, two, three, four. 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 So an otherwise normally sounding melody is now a little bit jazzier because it's syncopated. So one way to aid in reading and practicing rhythm is counting or count singing. And this happens, how helps rather a lot with rhythms like syncopation or anything else that's sort of complicated. So here is this uh, rhythm practice technique, count singing. If you're not familiar with it, it's taking each measure and counting up to whatever the number of beats that it's supposed to have inside of it. So for this example here, we're in common time, four, four time. So for each measure, we're going to count each note and subdivide it as necessary. So because quarter notes take one beat a piece, the first two notes only last for one beat a piece. So one, two, then we have eighth notes. So we have to break our three and four down into smaller pieces. Three and four and. Then our half note comes next. Those two numbers slide together. One, two, three, then four and. Our next rhythm in the third measure starts with 16th notes. And this is broken down even further. So we have our general beat, one, two, three, four. We have an eighth note subdivision, one and two and three and four and. And then if we go one smaller, we get 16th notes. So we have to make that exact same amount of time last for four notes now. And we do that by saying one E and a. Uh. That lasts for all four of those 16th notes. But if it goes in the same amount of time, it's one E and a two, three, four. Then our whole note is one, two, three, four. Here's what this melody sounds like when played on the piano. And the counting is said out loud. So I'm going to sing along and count at the same time. It goes like this. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, four, and one, e, and a two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I still have the same amount of time for each of the beats, but each of those smaller notes is subdivided, so it takes up the appropriate amount of time. This can help in aiding with your rhythm learning at home. So let's talk about the next part, pitch. We talk about pitch in two basic ways, high and low. And it's identified in sheet music by its placement on the grand staff. And so here I have a picture of the grand staff, which is the treble clef staff, one, two, three, four, five, and the bass clef staff, one, two, three, four, five, all put together by a big bracket here on the side. 
to show that all of this music happens simultaneously and none of it is supposed to be played at a different time unless that's showed within the music. And as I just mentioned, and we all know, each staff is made up of five lines and four spaces, always counted from the bottom up. So here's just a little um, slide with some fun mnemonic devices, probably the ones that you learned, um, like for bass clef, good boys do fine always, or all cows eat grass for the spaces. That's the one that I prefer to remember for bass clef is all cows eat grass because it's less confusing and um, you can remember the treble clef lines as well with every good boy does fine or my personal favorite every good burger deserves fries and of course the spaces inside of the treble clef spell out the word face f on the bottom a on the next c on the next and e on the top one last thing to remember about that is the musical alphabet always wraps around again on itself. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then it starts all over again. Like you can see at the bottom here of the bass clef. Good, then all boys, cows do eat fine grass always like that. It always just goes up and up and up. So how can you tell where the notes are going though? So pitch moves in two types of ways. It moves up or down or stepwise or skip. And obviously these two things happen simultaneously. Um, sometimes the notes stay the same and then it's not changing at all. So let's see here, we have our example here of stepwise ascending. The way that you can tell is by looking here at the note heads. And stepwise means that it doesn't skip any lines or spaces as it either ascends or descends as that second example shows. So always moving from one note to the very next one without anything in between. The other way is stepwise motion. And stepwise motion in music is when notes move from a line to a space or vice versa. It's pretty much any interval larger than a step is a skip. And an interval down here, I have a little uh, definition for you, is the number of steps from one note to the next. So stepwise is only one to two right here shown by the second. And anything else after that is the skip. So for example, looking down at those intervals where it says third, that bottom note is a C and that top note is E. The reason that it's a third is because when all three of those notes are put together, C, D, E, that makes three. So that interval is a third from bottom to top. The next one, still a C on the bottom, but F is now on the top. C, D, E, F are what encompass those. And there are four notes there. So that is the interval of a fourth. And you can see the rest of it goes through the exact same way. And sometimes there are major and minor differences that exist in here, but we're not going to go into those this evening. Last one that I wanna draw your attention to right here is the interval of an octave, which can be shown with the eight VE or eight VA, depending on what language it's being shown in. And that's this low C down here, middle C to the high C above it. And it's an octave because there are eight notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in between them. So now putting all of the elements of rhythm and pitch together, we create a melody. Also, we want some purpose thrown in there too. A melody is broken down into smaller chunks within the entire song called phrases. And this is everything that we're culminating to this evening, a musical phrase. A musical phrase does not have a set length that is defined by the number of measures. Instead, just like with spoken language, a phrase is a complete idea or thought, often with punctuation at the end, although not always. In written music, punctuation is also present at the end of a phrase in the form of a rest 
a longer held note or a cadence. And I'll show you what a cadence is in a moment. Um, there are some other ways too that I'll show you in just a little bit. But right here is an example of a musical phrase that we are familiar with ourselves. It's the song, Happy Birthday. And in fact, it's the very first phrase. Now there are, you know, a number of different notes inside of there, but it's all connected on the bottom with that long curved line from the start of happy to the end of you is that curved line showing that that entire thing is one musical idea, a phrase. And there are other phrases here. Songs are broken down into many of them. And sometimes phrases are broken down into micro phrases. So we have some sort of micro cycles inside of a macro cycle, inside of an even larger macro cycle at times. So here's another song that, we'll, that we are familiar with. Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. That's one phrase. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And that's another phrase. And you could argue that the second phrase has two smaller phrases inside of it because of the punctuation. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. But I think that I'll stick with the big argument here of one large phrase and two, uh, the second larger phrase there as well. Um, there's two boxes there at the very end that you can see at the end of each line. The top box is red and it says G dominant half cadence. You don't need to know what all of those words mean. This is just an example I wanted to show you, but a cadence is uh, that thing that I was uh, mentioning earlier, which is a progression of musical chords that go to an ending that is either anticipated or um, leads you to uh, toward anticipating more of the music. So it can be uh, a cadence that says, oh, there's more going on, or a cadence saying, this is the end. And there are some very familiar cadences that we know. That's a pretty familiar one. Um, there's also some other normal ones like one. We do those first three, one, two. That one is a leading cadence, a leading chord, because it goes back to its final one. And that's a cadence. It's an ending of a section or a phrase that either tells you it's going to go on to something else or it is ending. Um, let's see here. Oh, but when all else fails, follow the note head. That is the biggest bit of information that you can get. It tells you pitch, note direction, and basic duration of the note. The stem, which is that stick connected to it, denotes the voice. And um, so if you have multiple voices going at the same time, if there's a lower voice, the stems will all be pointed down. And the upper voice, the stems will all be going up. And that's the way that you can tell which notes the voice is supposed to sing. And the flag, this little thing over here, shows a subdivision. The flag also has another name. It's a quaver um, or a semi-quaver, um, but you can just call it a flag. And the flag doesn't show up until you get to the subdivided notes of eighth note, 16th and 32nd. There are other smaller subdivisions, but you rarely see them in music, um, at least not in the kind of music that we are going to be performing together. So um, this right here, the flag, can also be connected into beams, like when you have eighth notes and they have that line above them connecting them, or a grouping of four 16th notes that are also connected. 16th notes are a fun example because here, I'll come back to you and show you what I mean. 16th notes are fun because they have two lines or two, oops, two flags attached to them. Oh, hold on, marker. 
And those two flags are also shown in uh, the beamed version of them. So here's a regular old 16th note, just my drawing of it. Note head, stem, and it has two flags to show that it is twice as fast as an eighth note. But then when it's all beamed together, like in a grouping of four, one, two, three, four, boom, 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 excuse my drawing here. But when they're all grouped together, they also have both of the flags connected together. And that's how you can tell that all of those notes are the same value duration, that they last the same amount of time and they should be treated as equal. There are a couple of different ways that this changes and that's with some things like triplets. A triplet is in like a, a less common subdivision rather than just a duple splitting it in half, you split it into three. And those are either shown as three, quarter notes connected by a curvy line and a three right next to that curvy line or as eighth notes together and it looks the same triple it one two three just like that okay let's talk about a couple of other things here before we go to some questions some strange symbols and Italian words. Oh, here we go. We can talk about harmony for a moment as well. So other voice parts or instruments also provide harmony. Here's that voice thing that I was talking about. So we have two different uh, staves going on. This top line has soprano one and altos and the bottom line has tenors and basses. This says ones over here because this is a double choir piece. So you would have soprano ones, alto ones, tenor ones, bass ones all together, and then a separate choir of the twos. So you can see down here, the altos are on the bottom of the top line and you can tell what their notes are because all of their notes have the stems pointing down. Whereas the sopranos all have their stems pointing up. And you can also see where there's a difference in entrance. So the altos come in first. And there's even a rest shown there for the sopranos ahead of time. So you can see that their voice comes in later. Same thing down here for the tenors and basses. And they also have the same stems showing. Now, when you add the other voice parts, the same elements apply, although melody might not be what you're singing anymore. And it relies more on the chord structure and the progression of the song itself to determine what the harmonic notes are going to be. We're not gonna go into that tonight because that's substantially more in depth than I want to go. So let's talk about some strange music symbols and Italian words, because as I was thinking of the Italian words, I realized there are a lot of different things that we use Italian words for. But let's talk about the symbols first, because there's some funky ones. Um, I'm going to be referencing the music symbols and Italian words handout, and I'm going to come back to you real quick as well so that we can sort of see each other. So here is my handout right here. And um, there are, they rather are grouped into similar things and then they change as we go down. So we can just look at a couple of these together. There's an accent. That symbol looks like um, a sideways V or sometimes it can be um, upside down like a, a, a tent, depending on the type of accent, just means to make it louder than the rest of the notes. Staccato, oops, that one's the wrong one. That should just be a little dot. I apologize, that handout is incorrect. I'll fix it. Um, the slur, that's another curved note or a curved line that's different than a tie. A tie is taking the same note across a bar line or um, well, it always has to be the same note on the same line or same space, and they're just connected by that line underneath. A slur, however, can be any range of notes, and it does not have to be any particular number of notes either. Same thing with a phrase. They're marked the same way. Fermata. 
that's another way that a phrase or a passage of music can be ended. And a fermata is that bird's eye right there that sits on top of or below notes sometimes. And that means hold it until your conductor says to move forward. Or if you're singing a solo or performing a solo, hold it a little bit longer than you normally would or whatever feel, feels musically appropriate and then move on just like that. Um, oh, my favorite, cesura. That is the Italian word for train or railroad tracks. That's what we call it here in the United States and they call it um, tram tracks in the UK. It's the same idea and it's the same thing when you see train tracks in real life. You see them, you stop, right? Railroad like look up and see what's going on. Sometimes it's also represented as a grand pause or um, G period, P period. Um, a breath mark looks like a comma up in the air or an apostrophe. It says breathe here, because that's the appropriate spot to breathe. The um, antithesis to that is the dot, the dotted or dashed line that goes between notes, which means don't breathe here because that is a place that people want to breathe, but should not. That is why no breath marks are typically put in songs is because that's a spot that people would naturally gravitate toward breathing and the composer does not want that to happen. Double bar typically means end of the piece, sometimes can mean end of the, the passage, depending on what kind of music you're in. Um, but It, that is the end of song all done after that repeat we know what that looks like double bar with two dots do that section again brackets so those are technically called volta brackets and those are first ending second ending and how that works is you do one section and then you finish it with the first ending and then there's typically the repeat sign at the end of the first ending you go back to the beginning, do that whole section again, except this time you don't do the first ending. You skip that and move directly to the next measure, which is the second ending or alternate ending. So those are the brackets. We do have those in our songs a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, next, <gasps> Senyo. That right there. Um, and coda, coda is like one of those um, crosshairs. So you'll see it above a musical passage. And that is the symbol, the circle with the cross through it. That shows you this is the coda. And the coda is the ending passage of a song, the concluding passage of it. DC da capo is what that stands for. And da capo in music, um, in Italian, literally translates to to the head, da, go to the head, capo, go to the head, go to the beginning. And so you see this in other combinations, uh, DC al fine, uh, DC al segno, DC al coda, that all means go back to the beginning and then wherever it tells you to end, whether it's fine or go to the coda or go to the segno, that's what you're looking for to then move forward or finish the song, whatever the instructions are. All of these things are shorthand instructions so that the composer didn't have to write out the same thing over again, or the editor didn't have to waste more paper and write the same thing out over again if it's exactly the same music. It's just a way to shorten it. Um, DS, dal segno, go to the sign. That's what that means. And fine, we know what fine is. The end, all done, period. Okay, let's talk about music, Italian words, because there are a lot of them. And there are like six different areas that they talk about. They talk about dynamics and articulation and repeats and tempo and tempo changes and moods and just some other stuff in there too. Colors and each of these boxes is one whole chart. I'm just going to go through a couple of them real quick. 
dynamics. We know what some of these are, but it's all Italian. Piano, pianissimo. Easy just means very. Piano means quiet. Pianissimo means very quiet. There is such a thing as triple P, pianissimo, and quadruple P, pianissimo. Anytime you add an extra P, you add an EC. <laughs> Piano, pianissimo, pianissimo, pianissimo. Just like that. Same thing with forte. There's the mezzo in there, which means medium. There's mezzo piano, mezzo forte, but forte, loud, fortissimo, isimo, fortissimo, fortississimo. There's lots of isis. It's essentially blastissimo when you get that loud, blah, as loud as you can. Um, oh, and then the, the two other things, crescendo is the Italian word for to gradually get louder and decrescendo or diminuendo. Those are the same thing, which mean gradually get quieter. Not the same thing though, as the tempo stuff like ritardando or ritenuto, which means slow down, not the same thing. So let's talk about some tempo stuff. We know, um, little bit. Um, a tempo. A first tempo. Go to the first tempo that you were doing. Go back to what you were doing in that time. Um, then just some other like tempo markings. So short. Legato smooth, connected, pesante. That's a word that can go in either the articulation or mood because it's heavy, full, thick, um, not a happy sound <laughs> is typically what that is. Uh, and then vibrato, vibrato, <coughs> excuse me, is not necessarily an articulation. <coughs> oh no. <coughs> but it is a natural process that occurs while singing. So I put it in the articulation spot. And so that's the natural muscle process, which facilitates the rapid, repeated, slight change of a note. It's the uh, antithesis to straight. Great. Back and forth. Ah, just slight changes in the pitch up and down, which makes it freely vibrating. Um, repeats. We know what a lot of these are. Fine, the end, coda, conclusion. Get that sort of where that comes from. Senio, the sign. Uh, DC da capo. We've already gone over through uh, some of those things. Um, a lot of these make sense. They're, um, they're cognates, not even false cognates, straight up cognates like agitado. Sounds like agitated. That's what it is. Animato, animated, lively, right? Cantabile, you know, like the Spanish word cantar to sing? Cantabile, in a singing style. Con brio, that one's different. Con, we know with, brio is like energy, vigor, spirit, veracity, that sort of thing. Dolce, sweet, just like the word that we know. Grazioso, gracious. It's just the, the fancy Italian way to say that. Maestoso, that one is a little different, but it's majestic. Maestoso, like maestro, somebody who's big grand that sort of idea. Um, marcato, marked, that's another cognate there. And then sostenuto, another cognate that's close, sustained, meaning everything is very um, sustained. It's all on one level, it does not change much. And so that is more like tranquil, 
Also, tranquilo is another one of those things. Um, and then last, we have just the random other words that happen that we see so regularly, like con means with. So that is often paired with something else, like uh, con brio with lively movement. Uh, molto, very. We often see that with like molto retard or molto crescendo, um, very big uh, slowing down or very big getting louder. Non not or without, um, pew, more, poco a poco, little by little, you'll see that often with crescendo, get louder, little by little, or retardando, poco a poco, get um, slowly, slower, little by little. Um, simile, another cognate, do it in a similar style as you have been doing. Uh, subito, subito is suddenly, and it does not have to be anything in particular. It can be a subito articulation change. It can be subito dynamic change. It can be a subito tempo change as well. It's sort of um, a very, not super, but it is a jarring experience because you're going from one thing all of a sudden to something very different. And most of the time it's, um, an opposite of what you were just doing. So like if you were singing forte, subito piano is a whole lot of sound. And then all of a sudden people are having to listen real carefully to whatever hushed noises you're making. Uh, last one, we see this a lot, tutti. Everybody, all voices, anyone who is participating in the, in the ensemble, tutti, everybody do the thing. So let me come back to my presentation one more time, just to like wrap up real quick before I ask for any of your questions. Oh, here's this fun thing. So I found this on the internet. This is a, a, a picture of the introduction, the theme song to The Simpsons. And I, I wanted to show this to you because there's a couple of different things that are highlighted in here, like literally highlighted in yellow. Um, and there are some chord structures, but it's fun because you can see um, the very beginning, there are those straight lines in between those notes where it says harp gliss all the way at the very, very top. That means glissando, the harp goes all the way from the bottom. You know, going to those different notes and everything in between. Um, and then you can even see those hands are crossing, meaning that they're going in opposite directions. So they're crossing each other on the harp. And then just the overlap of all sorts of fun things. You can see the pianissimo um, dynamic marking there. There's uh, some chord stuff that's marked C, C din seven, C six. Those are chord structures. Uh, C flat five, that's another chord structure and pluses, all those things. There's that piano with the crescendo marking that looks like the uh, crosshair, well, not the crosshair, but like a hairpin opening up to mezzo piano, piano plus, and then the theme highlighted in yellow. pretty neato. Lastly, oh, here, I'll read this fun little tidbit down here. Uh, fun fact, that's Danny Elfman and two others singing the opening three Simpsons, or the three syllables, the Simpsons. Elfman stated that the royalties from that alone paid for his health insurance for 25 years and got him into the Screen Actors Guild for vocal work, which is pretty legitimate in and of itself. Lastly, there's much more to music, like key signatures, major and minor, timbre, structure of music, musicality. Well, there's only so much time in an evening. So thank you for your time and your attention with this. And what questions can I answer? Yeah, Lacey. I just want to prove a point to one of my old music directors. So in past, uh, when you're talking about like past music structures, the structure was put into place for like different sections of vocalization or different sections of music, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's put into sections of mathematics, like every um, sort of 
Yeah, like our one, two, structure. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then things broken down inside of that box. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I tried to argue with one of my music professors that in the olden days, bar structures used to be commas, but now they're equal signs. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You are definitely correct in that. And that's okay. maybe like a more philosophical way to explain it, but yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. My music professor really hated that idea, and I'm glad that I am correct in that. You are I, correct. I felt like that was pretty adamant in that in the old days it used to be a comma, but in these days it's more of an equal sign. Uh-huh, because in the old days, what, like, thousand years ago? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we're not talking about, like, that long ago, but, like, really, a thousand years ago, when playing song and chant were, like, the thing that was being performed and musically that was um, the main source of com composition and also um, of musical performances were done for sacred things and, you know, ceremonies and rituals and stuff like that they first of all didn't write it down for a very long time and second of all when they did start writing it down it wasn't really great they didn't have a good way of writing it down so they had to make things up as they went along and then when that bar line came in it was like this is where you breathe it's the pause the comma <laughs> where the next phrase is gonna come afterward. Whereas now, the reason that we break it down is because um, it's, it's for efficiency and for multiple instruments to be working at the same time while also making it to the end at the same time. Because what happens is, is if you have different musical structures that are happening at the same time, but are not the same, one person can be moving further ahead inside of their music and have it not chordally or structurally, like progression wise, line up with the rest of the ensemble. And therefore it just, it doesn't sound like a cohesive unit, but instead just disjunct to instruments that are sort of trying to match up, but not quite making it there. So it came from the idea, thank you, Eden, it was good to see you. Um, yeah, it came from the, the idea of making it more efficient so that more people could perform at the same time. It all always comes down to efficiency. Why did we create the conveyor belt for efficiency? Why did we create? What is that? Oh my gosh. Uh, that line, Ford. Ah! The assembly line. Assembly line. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Why did we come up with, why did Ford come up with the assembly line? For efficiency, it's the exact same thing. And their efficiency method when they first started was add that little break right there because that just makes it easier for our eyes to see that's the grouping, that's the general idea. It was pretty cool. Okay, so I have a question. Yes. I'm familiar with what the eighth and sixteenth notes would sound like, but what I'm not really familiar with the thirty second. Like what would that sound like? Ooh, fast. Is really fast? <laughs> okay. Yes. So is that like thirty two little beats within a beat or within a minute? No, okay. within a whole note. Not within one beat, but within a whole, a whole note. Mm -hmm. 32 little tiny increments inside of a whole note yep like 32 itty bitty slices of pizza far too small they go way too fast it's <laughs> just like pizza <laughs> do we have any of those kind of notes in any of our songs um any of our songs not yeah. many we have a couple of 30 second notes but like really it's probably literally a handful okay may i songs that um, Je Jennifer, yeah. if you want to hear a lot of itty bitty notes within a measure, um, listen to the Death Fairies Waltz. Okay. There are a bunch of itty bitty notes within a bunch of measures that is insane. And it's one of the most hardest pieces to play on any musical. Mm -hmm. What's it called? The Death? The Death Fairies Waltz. Okay. Death Fairies Waltz. Okay. That sounds super duper fun. 
I used to hate having to play 30 second notes. <laughs> no one likes them typically. Yeah, not necessarily just for drums, but drums are the more common instrument for them to be played on. Um, other uh, tongued instruments like in marching band often do uh, have 30 second notes. Yes, yeah, snares do 30 second notes that are marked off. However, when snares do 30 second notes, they're, they're not doing all 32 of those. They have the snare underneath of them or underneath of the, the actual drum head on the bottom side. Makes they, it easy. <laughs> huh? Makes it easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. The invention of the snare was uh, incredibly helpful for marching bands to like make that noise go further to like uh, a harsher, more striking sound. What else can I talk about? Anything Italian, anything old music based? I just always, I remembered back into, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember like back into my days of marching band, specifically in high school and then later in college, that um, the whole appeal of like a cadence for when you are marching and if you were marching at a, a different, you know, beat. And so it was kind of always interesting because each time we did a march or a parade of some kind, uh, the drum section would make up that cadence and whatever they came up with was what we were going to be marching to. Yeah. So it's fascinating because, and it was such a neat process to see them all working together and how they put it together. And I just think that that's always one of those things that kind of stuck with me is like, when you think about it, it it's, it's um, things around you in your life are, are a cadence there are everything that you Absolutely. do your, your walk is a cadence your run is a cadence your jogging is a cadence beat it's kind of something that you just can pick up in just everyday movements that you're doing agreed definitely agreed with you um i zia saw your question about it is um i don't often see it in our music and i have not really seen it in music hardly ever you know what though i will not waste time on it at this moment but i'll find out what it is called and i'll tell because <laughs> there's some old symbols as well that would be pretty fun if any of you are interested in seeing like what music notation used to look like there's uh, this thing called shape note notation, which is um, super well known for um, American education, like music books. I can't remember exactly what they're all, but they're like Psalters and Psalm hymn books from mm -hmm. early colonial days in America. And they literally have different shapes for the notes. So people who could not read music tell that the different shapes were in different spots and this one was this note and that shape was that note it's really really fascinating stuff i like learning about it sacred harp is a movie a documentary about shape notes and shape note notation mm -hmm. in the history of that mm -hmm. it's very cool stuff anything else i can answer for you This evening, probably a lot of review for most of you, but there's these handouts are yours. I'm going to create the slides for this presentation immediately after I sign off here and post them inside of our Google Drive folder so you can have access to those uh, whenever you would like them. You can print them off at home, use them to your heart's desire. Oops. Tell me to take my medication. Excellent. Um, was there anything that I missed in the chat that I did not address? <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
and I will see you all next week. Do we have any announcements real fast?